I want to talk to you a little bit about what it means to follow God. Um, because I, I think so much of what is presented to us in the social media, um, right down to the shelves at the grocery store, at the checkout stand, um, Christianity is presented as the absolute problem solving, if you'll follow this pathway, you'll never be lost again, solution. And unless a person understands certain principles that are laid out, they're actually told to us in a story or narration, but unless we take them to ourselves to understand what this might mean for us, just as I did last week with Sarah and made the application to me and to you, this is another one of those messages where you've got to make the application. Now, I ask you a question. We all know how God called Saul, and he was a religious man. He was zealous for his cause and was against the Christians before his Damascus Road experience. And we might all be very familiar with that and say, that's great, and then Paul has this experience, and he's now blinded, being led into a city. A prophet tells him certain things. The scales fall from his eyes, and straightway he goes out, and he begins to preach the word of God. And some, some heard this man, and they did not believe. They didn't trust him. How could this man be saved? Do you know what he did before? Do you know what, what group of people he was aligned with? But if you follow the Apostle Paul's life from just from the time of his conversion in the ninth chapter of Acts, and you realize that God's hand is not only in the, what is revealed afterwards, but God's hand was working before. This principle, many times people will come into the church and they will not see that, that God had chosen Saul as a vessel up until whatever, this, whatever his age was, up until that ninth chapter of Acts. He was still a chosen vessel before the ninth chapter of Acts occurs in our chronological thinking. He was still a chosen vessel of God, having sat at the feet of Gamaliel, learned all of the customs and all of the religious understanding that then at the right time, would be brought into the church, and only he with that mindset could explain other things that even someone like Peter would not be able to make plain to others. So God's hand was on this man before. We call that prevenient grace. God was acting before he knew it. And even in the just the elements that lead up to his conversion, where he's holding the cloak of Stephen, as Stephen is stoned. Even leading up to that point, God was still looking on. God was still very much present. Now, I ask you, before I get into my message, and I think this is really important. I had to ask it of myself. I ask you to take a minute and just think about this before we move on too quickly. It is hard sometimes to see God working in the before, in the where I was before God brought me here frame of reference. Now, I'm not going to ask people to stand and give a testimony. We don't do that here. Everybody has one. But how many can raise their hand and understand, looking back at wherever they came from, that that was actually God preparing you for this time? That's almost all of you. That blesses my heart because that tells me you have been well taught and you've received it and you understand it. There's many people who think that all the stuff that happens in their life is not relevant and that all that stuff beforehand, there was no purpose in it, but there was a purpose. I taught a message one time about Joseph being in prison and the title of my message was Joseph in prison for a purpose. Now, could Joseph have known when his brother sold him into that slave chattel. Could the brothers have known, could Joseph have known that he would be put in prison, that he would be essentially left as dead in the, in the mind or the eyes of his father, 
and that his being there in prison, would ulti- God would ultimately enter into everything that happened to make it that Joseph would save his people, all of his people, and essentially be a type of savior for his people in that time. But if you were only to look at what happened before, you'd say, no way. Now, don't do what most people do. They tend to jump to people who've had these great conversion experiences, and I know many people like that, and then they begin to judge, well, I haven't had something like that, therefore. No, 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 I'm talking about every disaster you ever made, everything that has happened in your past that brings you to a time that then you can at some point turn around and recognize You know, God was in it. He was letting me find my own way and make my own mess and run amok as I did. God was there with me. He wasn't correcting me. He was not necessarily um, sparing me, but he was leading me. And so here we have this very same thing with Paul. And then suddenly Paul is now not only converted, if you will, Uh, has this experience, but he receives and is filled with the Holy Spirit. That would be the ninth chapter and the 17th verse. And on he goes to preach, and he begins a ministry that has him moving around. He's going to Damascus and then on to Jerusalem. And then if you skip ahead a few chapters, you will find that uh, Paul is going to somewhere turn up, going to minister in Seleucia, onto Cyprus, Paphos, Pergia, and Pamphylia, and so on and so forth, to Iconium, to Lystra, Derby, and the cities of Lyconia. And we have Acts 15, which is the famous church council. You've got to skip ahead just a little bit. To the 16th chapter of Acts. And I want to, I want to deliver the message, but I also want you to think of what this means for you today. And there, again are multiple messages in this. See, a lot of times we think God calls us. He found me. He he washed me. He cleansed me. He spared me. He sanctified me. I'm here now, right? And that means that everywhere I go, it'll all be all right, right? Thank God you have a sense of humor about you. I think that's what happens not just for a minister, But as a believer, and as all believers, we tend to think that because the Lord has found us somehow, we will stay in this realm and we will not deviate, or that the Lord will not bring us into areas that we are confronted with certain things that really defy everything we have come to know in the I'm here mode. So here we have Paul. And he wants to go off, by the way, to Asia. And for some reason, the Spirit did not let him. And then they want to go off to Bithynia. And somehow, the Spirit did not let him. And now I'm in the 16th chapter. And I'll read a little bit of what I just said to you. Now, when they were gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to preach the word in Asia. Now, Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Because here's a man going to plant churches and to preach, but the Spirit forbade him to go. And that's that's why I said it seems clear to me that a lot of times we think, well, it ought to be this way because we've come to know this thing. The Lord ought to make this the way. It doesn't always happen like that. And after they were come to Mysia and they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Well, why not? I'm going to be here doing God's work. Somebody's got to get the job done, right? Wrong. And they passing by, Maesia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. This is kind of interesting because, you know, I I don't know anybody except for, that I would say I actually would believe, except for um, hearing Dr. Scott tell of Pop Scott who had a vision. And I believe that he had a vision. Um, I've not really known anybody who's had a vision, or if they've had a vision, I've not really known if I could believe them. (laughs) (laughs) Because most of the time they'll say, and the Lord said to me, and I think, well, if you got it so good with the Lord, tell him to come and tell me so I can hear it from him. But 
there was a lot of these different things going on, which I believe to be true. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Uh, think about that. I, wouldn't I love to have that? Wouldn't you love to have that clarity of somebody saying, Hey, and your name, I'm calling your name now, and I'm telling you, come on, let's go. Oh, I'd love that clarity, wouldn't you? <laughs> but normally it doesn't happen that way, right? <laughs> You feel sometimes like you're just spinning in the dark. I mean, I'm telling you some of my experiences are right here on these pages. Not the vision part, but the spinning in the dark. Yes. And after he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. That's one of those things that I love about studying the Bible, uh, which is not my topic right now uh, of what I'm going to point out. But if you see the switch after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. It tells you that in this particular case, Paul was not writing. Some people say Paul wrote this part. But you can see the switch in after he had seen and then we endeavored. It tells you there was another party writing this. We endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And that assuredly gathering is just simply one word in the Greek, soon be bezontes. And simply what that is, is being knit together in assurance. There, there was something that was, you could not tear us apart. We knew, like um, a page out of Oral Roberts, you know that you know that you know that you know. Just like that, that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel unto them. <clears throat> Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. And what's interesting is once they get to Philippi, here's where they first end up going. On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by Riverside where prayers were wont to be made. We sat down and spake unto the women which, res which resorted thither. And this is what's interesting. Most of the time, as a minister, as someone who's entrusted with the gospel, I often see the, an easy mistake we can make, which is we think we should end up going to speak to great multitudes, or we should end up going to speak to certain people of influence, but he goes, they end up speaking to women. And in that day, women didn't really hold that much clout, although this woman was a businesswoman, um, but it didn't matter. They end up speaking to the women which lived there. And a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Another missing ingredient when people talk about how they win people to the Lord. No, God's got to open up the heart of someone for them to be able to hear and receive. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If we have judged me to be, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come into my house and abide there. She constrained us. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is in today's day and age how people talk about ministry. This would be, bar none, a very disappointing missionary or evangelical endeavor to go to speak to women. Now, I don't say that as sexist. I'm, I want you to see this time to recognize that wouldn't have been a big victory right there. But... Something else is revealed here. See, God plants people in certain places, restrains Paul from going to certain places to go to a place initially just to speak to this woman, you would think. Then read on with me. And you see, in the 16th verse, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. The Greek literally, literally reads, Numa. Puthoma, Puthona, which is the spirit of Python, the spirit of the snake, which was brought, she brought her masters much money by soothsaying. The same followed Paul in us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show, us, show unto us the way of salvation. Now what's interesting is, I have had some of these spirits sometimes, not the Python, but the one that just says, Oh, you're so great, we love you. You're preaching the word of God. We love you. And they'll follow you around. They'll hit you with great flattery. But Paul could see through this spirit. It says she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, 
turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. There was a spirit inside of her that was now rebuked, came out of her the same hour. Now you might say, well, that's a good thing, right? That's a very good thing. But it's what happens next that leads up to not such a good thing. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. You know, now that you've touched my pocketbook, you're going to pay. Kicked out that spirit that was in that woman. She's not walking around anymore singing the praises of Paul, perhaps, but the prophets are gone, F-I-T, are gone. <laughs> Nowadays, you've got to clarify that, I guess, because everybody's a prophet. F-P-H-E-T. <clears throat> and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. That's a lie. They didn't do anything. They just rebuked the devil out of, out of a woman. They should have been rejoicing, but that hurt their pocketbook. These men... Being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to beat them, all for casting out a demon out of a woman. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, that just seems very poetic, but we're talking about lashing, beating, whipping, lashing, beating. Stripes just seems just... It's poetic. We can't see the, vul the vulgarity of what has happened. They cast him into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, into the inner, inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, this is what I would like us to kind of depart from for a minute, which is sometimes we think... We are being led to do something. And sometimes we're even hindered as people of God from progress. And I think a lot of times we take the hindrance as either God has departed from us or God is not with us or God must be doing something else because he's not paying attention. I've been praying, I've been asking, and it's not happening. Now, I want you to make this apply to you because I made it apply to me. There's nothing that I preach to you, that I teach you, that I haven't digested in my spirit. I can take a page out of my own life and say, I've had ups and downs in my health. I feel relatively good today. In fact, I'd say I feel great today, but yesterday not so much, and the day before not so much either. And I still had to conduct business and go about. And I really, this kind of was so in my mind because I kept thinking, Lord, what are you doing? I need to be healed. And I'm seemingly doing everything right. Does this sound familiar for some of you? You're doing everything right, and God is not entering in, but you, you're doing it all. You're, you're praying. You're going to the table of the Lord. You're asking God, and something is not happening. I ask again, is that you? Yes, ma'am. So then I'm not weird. But a lot of times we can get locked into the mindset that says God is not doing anything. And we forget about the before part. Remember where I started. We forget about the, the before part, all the way that the Lord has been with us through the years, what he's seen us through, how he's delivered us. And in a moment, we can forget about all of that and begin to look at the circumstance. Now, I'm going to be the first one to admit to you that when I read this, there's multiple things that speak to my heart. This vision came to him. They were absolutely certain Without a doubt, the Lord had called them for to preach the gospel unto those in Macedonia. Without a doubt. And I'm speaking today of some of you who are here and you know without a doubt you desire to press close to God, you desire God's best, you're, you're staying in the Word. Things are not changing for you. Your life is not changing. Nothing seems to be changing. In fact, if anything, it seems to be somewhat getting worse. Uh, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I don't want to see it. God does not guarantee. There is no guarantee in God's word that bad things won't happen. But there is a guarantee that God will enter into all things.
to work his good. That is a guarantee. That is a promise of God. In fact, as I started looking at this, I started to, all the promises that I know started to well up inside of me, and I said, wait a minute. I'm spending way too much time looking at the circumstance and not enough time doing something else because I know I've committed my way to the Lord, and I know in doing that, and if I acknowledge him through his word, he will lead me. His word becomes a lamp under my feet to guide me in the darkest hours. When I think that God is not, then I know he is. When I'm weak, I'm made strong through him. It's all of those things that begin to well up, and I thought, how many here have been toiling and then something happens to put you completely off course. This cannot be the Lord. This cannot be. And let me go back to the women they encounter. So Lydia, we might say this was determined by God for this woman to be there. Why? Because if you read carefully, it says that this woman worshipped God. She just needed direction. She needed to hear there's a lot of that going around. So I, I can see God's hand in putting them right there. And this woman, by the way, who's a seller of purple, that's a subtle nuance to tell you, this woman had big money because purple was very hard to come by. It came out of shells and other uh, fish objects. Very hard to come by, very expensive. So the fact that she sold this tells you this is a woman of means. And I don't think it's an accident. You'll find that I don't care what Bible you want to read, but when I read Paul, I do understand something. If you're not reading Paul aright, like most of the church world I've encountered, they say, well, Paul, he didn't have anything good to say about women. Well, his first convert right here is a woman. And if you read Romans 16, you're going to find the bulk of those people listed in Romans 16 that he's saluting and calling fellow laborers are women. And the woman who delivered the Roman letter was a woman. So... Spare me. I'm, I'm just like Paul in this. Galatians 3 and 28 tells me there's either, there is neither bond nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ Jesus. I will not hear people talk about things that they know nothing about to belittle and live. If you want to live in the 16, 15 and 1600s, folks, be my guest. Don't talk to me about, well, you know, Apostle Paul, his first convert's a woman. Yeah, and a rich one, too. And if you keep going, there's another one that was demon-possessed. Now, God entered into the first one because she worshipped God. God entered into the second one, even though she was off track and following them around with great flattery to cast the demon out. And strangely enough, from this passage forward, you, you might say, well, this is not fair. Paul did nothing wrong. Silas did nothing wrong. They were obeying the Lord. They were following God's plan. Now they are in prison. They are beaten. They are bloody. They are sitting in the inner, inner prison. Now, not like our prisons today, even the inner, inner prisons, or if you want to call it the whole or solitaire, there's nothing like this type of an inner, inner prison, but surrounded by other prisoners, which, which were murderers, and thieves. And now these are two men who have done nothing wrong and now thrown in prison. And you know perhaps where I'm going to go with this, but I want you to make an application. It says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. They prayed and sang praises, hymned, hymned, hymned hymns unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now you know the rest of this which is suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. I never preach this message when I've gone into an institution. <laughs> in fact, some of you guys were with me that one of the first times I went in and I was going to preach on Rahab. Because, you know, because of her face, she put the cord over the window. And then at the last minute when I got up to speak, I said, in my mind, I said, oh, I don't think I should preach that. That could inspire some wrong thoughts. <laughs> so it was like one of those last minute things. I switched gears and my message today is the clay and the potter. <laughs> Be safe. 
But I told you, you never preach this in prison. You never know. But what I want to say is that most of us wouldn't be able to see God was still with them. And now, step out of this for a minute and realize two things. They are, they've been beaten, they are bound, and at midnight, in the inner, inner prison, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises, hymned hymns unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And afterwards, there's an earthquake. Now, most of us in that situation would come into it and say, Lord, bring the earthquake to open the doors. But instead, a remarkable thing happened. And this is something that the Lord prepared me for actually this morning, which is why my spirit isn't low about the attendance this morning. I was really anticipating it to be just about where it is. You didn't surprise me. I came understanding that there are some things that I cannot change. I came this morning to praise God because I know that as, as soon as I begin to look at the circumstance, the circumstance becomes a prison. The circumstance will hold me back. But if I begin to look at this and I begin to praise God and say, praise God for the situation. Praise God that you are here with me. Praise God where two or three are gathered, you are in our midst. Praise God for all of that then. Hold on, folks. <laughs> then. That's another channel. But what I want to show you here is that the Apostle Paul and Silas are not like MacGyver. They are not trying to, hey, okay, you get over there and we'll, we'll, we're out, we're free. 30 seconds, it's going to blow up. They prayed, I know, it's good to be silly to get you out of this, I've read this before, I know what this is, and you start thinking, I know this, but it never applies to you, and it never applies to me. And what good is this book if you can't take something away from here and say, yes, I am in a prison, and for some people, their prison is not like Paul and Silas. For some people, it is a prison. Just everyday living can be a prison. Your environment, your job, your family, your friends, for some people, it's addiction. And they cannot break free. They cannot, as long as you stay peering at the bars that hold you in, which is your circumstance, you will never be free. And only men who have been made free in Christ and women who have been made free in Christ can sing, and then they are never in prison. They can never be put in prison. When you begin to sing and understand the circumstance will be there, but God will see you through. Amen. Now, the hardest thing, the hardest thing to remember in all of this, and it's a difficult one, I had to practice this this morning. I want you to know, I didn't just come here and say, I'm going to preach this to you. I had to practice this this morning for this to really be real for me. First praise. First praise and thanksgiving, like they did. First praise. I'm not looking at the circumstance. I'm not looking at the circumstance. Laying in bed almost for two days. One day was completely sick. The other one was suffering from the very brink of extreme dehydration, and I didn't even know it. You ever forget to drink water for one day? Yeah. Well, do that for about three or four. And then you, you, when you start shaking and you're, you, you have shivers and you can't stop, you, I, I knew. I knew what the signs were, and I knew, my goodness, I'm severely dehydrated. And I, I had that happen about 20 years ago. Well, it was 1998, so less than that, 20 years ago. Same day Dr. Scott went to the hospital that you were driving. Where did I go? Into the ER for dehydration. I went into the emergency room for dehydration, same thing. So I knew, I knew the, the symptoms. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you it's easy to look at your sickness and say, I'm bound by this thing. It's easy to look at your circumstance. My, whole, my financial frame is collapsing, or I have no personal life, or seemingly I have no friends. Don't laugh at that. There are people in this congregation that have very low social skills. That's not an insult. That's a reality check. And the ability to just say, I have a friend. Some people are friendless, and the, the reality is you'll never be friendless. You have Christ with you, and his, his spirit is with you. But, but even that can become a prison. 
You, see, you might say, well, if a person's alone and they're free, how could that be a prison? It becomes a prison of the mind. When you have no one that you can, you pray to God, but you have no one to, to open your mouth and say, will you agree with me? That's why I'm so glad we have our 24-hour phone lines. That If you're ever alone, you know, after you've prayed to God, you can pick up the phone line and say, this is on my heart, and this is my prayer request. And you know you've made contact with somebody on the other end of the phone who's there 24 hours a day. That, that, that is another thing that separates this ministry from any other ministry. Is that's the purpose, being able to connect with somebody. You're never alone. You're never alone. Christ is always with you, and you're never alone. But now, let me take you back here for a minute. They've done nothing wrong. They're in prison. They've suffered physically. They start singing. And let me ask you, during the last seven days, while you felt something was happening to you that was maybe your prison, something unfair to you, something you you feel you cannot break free from, instead of praising God, you began to complain and lament and get down and I'm going to use the D word, depressed in spirit, instead of saying, thank you, Lord, I I don't know what you're going to do with this situation. I don't know what you're going to do. I, I have an addiction. I have a family matter. I have been bankrupt now. I am homeless. Whatever your issues are, instead of saying, you say, well, how could you be praising God in the midst of that? Well, just look at these men. That's exactly what they did, and then God entered in. It wasn't the other way around. God didn't deliver, and then they praised They praised first to God, and then God delivered. And until you get that principle, you will be bound by whatever has bound you as your prison. I woke up this morning and I said, I am going to put this message that I have studied into practice with you, not only just to preach it to you, for you to be liberated. I need to preach it for me, not only about my health conditions and about my other issues that I have to deal with concerning this ministry, but this church. You see, there's a great multitude out there that need this message of encouragement. They don't need to be told, send $59.99 for your special seed, whatever. (laughs) They don't need that. They don't need to send away so you can get an anointed handkerchief. (laughs) They don't need that. I needed to do that, though. I just saw it there, and I said I needed to do that. (laughs) I better not see this on eBay. What is the point of coming to church, friends, if you can't leave here with something to hang on to? My late husband used to call it faith handles. If you have something that you leave here and you say, well, I heard what she said. I'm I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to put this into practice, how I'm going to start doing this. Start by taking baby steps. Start by recognizing what it is you are dealing with that is your prison, that you feel whether it's unjust or just, whether you had it coming or you didn't, it doesn't matter. The point of this message is recognize where you're at and begin to praise God, even if, it's, even if it is in the most preposterous setting. We had one of our very faithful king's houses in the hospital. And when I went to visit, I didn't hear somebody whining and complaining. I heard somebody praising God. And my spirit immediately, as I, I, and I already came in on a spiritual high. Was already, there was already a good spirit in the room, and praise be, was just flowing in the room. I think that's when God does enter in. I don't think God will not enter in if you're sitting there and and crying or complaining, but I think this is what gets God's attention. Praise, and then came the deliverance. Now, how do we get to that from here? Well, you, you start looking through this book, and you find certain things that even Paul said. Later on, he says, about himself. He says, essentially, he died with Christ, but he lives. He says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ that liveth in me. And you begin to understand that there there are things that will come your way. And the minute you begin to praise God and you begin to, you give thanks to him, even in the moment of tribulation, take another page out of Paul's writing, Romans 5, in that golden chain where he talks about how these things Tribulation brings what? Triedness, and triedness brings what? And Okay, I'll take those words too, endurance. And all of these things bring a sum total. 
that we are not ashamed. We have this hope that we're not ashamed of because all of this, what I've called the golden chain that begins with tribulation, ends up in glory. God will enter into this thing, Romans 8, to work his good to them that are the call, to those that love him for a specific purpose, not just willy-nilly, I'll work everything out. No, I'm like, toss the salad, it'll all work out good. You're not an accident. I'm not an accident. This church is not an accident. I look at the history of this church and I say, there is no way that I'm going to begin looking at the circumstances and the scene in front of me to limit me to what I know God has done to set me here to open doors into the rest of the world. And if that means that the people here, maybe some of you have been a little bit intimidated. Maybe some of you feel like you're in your own prison, so you can't even help me. I'm telling you exactly what Paul and Silas did at midnight. Let's sing. Let's sing something that gives glory to God. Let's sing praises to God. Still in prison, and then the earthquake. And how should this end for us? What should be the sum total for us? What is the walk away message in all of this? Maybe, maybe for some of you listening to me, you have that prodigal mindset that you were here, you fell away, and there's just, that is your prison now. You can never get back to where you were. Well, how about getting up like the prodigal and heading back to the Father's house, which is here, and in your prayer life, and you become Bethel again, the house of God. And once you get back to that, you recognize there are many prodigals around you, and there are many. We're all sinners. There's nobody in this place that can say, I'm perfect. I heard one man, I told you one time, say he never sinned a day in his life. And I said, that's a lie. <laughs> so my question is, what's holding you back? What prison, whether it's real in your mind or it's, it's a reality you have to deal with, what is holding you back from doing exactly what these men did. And they began to sing, and the prisoners heard them. That's the other thing. I don't necessarily think that as they began to sing praises unto God, that they were saying, yeah, and maybe these other guys will get saved too, because, you know, we got a, we got a captive audience. That's a real captive audience for you. <laughs> they didn't care who heard them. In fact, the one who hears them, who actually has an impact, is, is the jailer. Because afterwards, he's worried. He's about to kill himself. He's worried that he's going to pay a penalty because he's supposed to be keeping these people safely in the prison. And with the doors open and all these people loosed out of their chains, he's going to run for his life. And they tell him, no, no, no. And he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? Can you imagine even the Philippian jailer right there at that moment? I'm just thinking of this and, and thinking that's even a miracle. God entered in right there to save that man. Now think about Philippi and think about what's happened here. A woman who is rich, a woman who is demon-possessed, a Philippian jailer and his whole family. And 11 years later, Paul is sitting in another jail in Rome. And Epaphrodites brings to him a gift, which essentially he didn't really need. He was in prison. And the letter, the joy letter that is written, every single theologian, every single book you'll read, it says the joy letter, the letter to the Philippians was penned there. And you realize that these people must have been profoundly touched by the word of God and by what they saw happen there at Philippi because these people, above any other church, when all others would not help Paul, these came through. These were giving beyond what they had, begged with much begging for him to take. And he said, I don't desire this, but I desire fruit abound to your account to the Corinthians who could never be like those Macedonian Christians. Why? You'll read it right here. The whole ministry at Philippi, ordered by God, touched by God, delivered by God. So I'm not sure where this message will hit you. I know it hit me. I, I, I came here today saying, after a great victory, normally we have this. It's a tradition here, right? After a great victory, right? That's what happens here. Everybody, oh, it's great, okay. Now, you know, nothing surprises me. But I'm just telling you, and I want you to do the same thing. I won't be bound by this anymore. And the reason why I won't be bound by this is because I know the great things that God has for me, the design and purpose he has for me is much greater 
And at this moment in time, I cannot see the great things. I know the great things he's done, but there's great things ahead. I have to keep looking forward, looking unto him. And the times when I feel that new bars are going up and new hindrances are coming, instead of whining about them, instead of trying to get people to understand what it is, my first place is going to be to sing praises. So I'm going to ask you, if I'm Paul and you all represent Silas, are you ready to sing, church? Yes, well, let's sing. That's my message. Come on up. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.